dog, dog, dog. Here we go. Lone Star Cowboy Church. How nice it is to see all of your faces this morning. We're so glad you chose to worship with us today. If you're a visitor, good. We're delighted you're here. We hope you like how we do things. If you're watching us on the internet, good morning. There again, we hope you like how we do things. And of course, all of you regulars, you know how important you are. My little thought for the day is this. Rely on the Lord, for only he can turn a mess into a message a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph, and what's broken into something beautiful. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful to be in your house this morning, and we thank you for all the blessings of this week and for everybody who's in attendance today. We ask that you bless us as we worship, and we ask that you guide our speaker as he gives us words and tells us about things that we may not have heard before. We thank you for this band. We thank you for the music ministry that they provide for us. We thank you for all the healing that's been in our church this week. And we ask for continued blessings as we go through our things throughout this week. Guide and direct us in all that we do, for it's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Well, our regular announcements this week, please refer to your bulletin. There's a whole lot of things in the bulletin that I'm not going to go through today, but there's a lot of information there. Don't forget, Monday night service is at 6.30. Dinner's at 6.30. Service starts at 7. Women's Bible study is here at the church 2 o'clock on, on Tuesday afternoon. Wednesday night is regular Bible study for children, for the youth, and for the adults. We feed at 6 o'clock. We have service starting at 6.30. For the kids this week, don't forget, this is water day for the children on Wednesday night. So send them. With appropriate clothing, we ask that you let the girls have on a one-piece suit. Remember to send them a towel and their flip-flops. They're going to play, and they're going to get wet and dirty. Uh, today is the last day to register for church camp. So if you have questions, um, Chris, are you here today? Would you stand up for me? 
Chris is in the back, and he probably has all of the information that you need if you need registration forms or if you have any questions about church camp. But by, by the time we leave church today, you need to have registered if you're going to church camp. Today, we're going to honor our seniors. We do have some. That'll come in just a little bit. We have a very special guest speaker today, so let's do a Lone Star welcome to Mr. Gary Savitt. Greg, I'm sorry, <laughs> I wrote it down wrong. He's going to not only give us our message today, but he's going to be in charge of the Seder meal tonight. Now remember, we're having covered dish lunch, or dinner, I guess I should call it, at five o'clock, so bring something to eat, we'll put all of our food out together, and then we'll turn everything over to him. Um, today, after the service is finished, if you guys would pick up your row of chairs on the section closest to the wall, we want to stack them against the wall. The two middle sections, we will just stack them in a row, and then the far section over there, put them up against the wall. We need a little bit of help after service to get all of that done. Um, uh, you'll find it in your bulletin, but on June the 11th, there's a business meeting on the Take America Back <coughs> to God and that's at the 31 Church, and it's at 2 p.m. that day. And that's real important if any of you can go. To the best of my knowledge, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Miss Wanda. Good morning, Lone Star Cowboy Church. A great, big, loud amen, please. Amen. Is it good to be in God's house? Amen. Well, uh, remember all the announcements, but... Uh, I want to just start off, just continue to lift my our friend, my friend, Buddy, up. You know, he's fighting and with everything he's got, but he's got a lot of challenges right now. So please just keep him in your prayers. You know, if you're and Barbara, anyone's lifting in, we're praying for you, Barbara, and some strength and comfort for you, all your whole family. But let's just have a good time in the presence of the Lord tonight. In Psalms, just today, Psalms chapter 27, verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. For wait for the Lord. Apple. A. Yep. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place While we walk the pilgrim's pathway Clouds will overspread the sky But when traveling days are over Not a shadow, not a sigh When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all We'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the tolls of life repay. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will be. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. We all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and Shout the victory. Amen. Did that work, Mickey? <laughs> he says he likes the old ones. So there we go. That's a good one. Old but good. All right. And we got a, Aunt Terry's brought a kind of a new song for us, but a great message. Here we go. i 
Lord, I was sleeping. Lord, you were working on a mess I made like only I can do. When I start thinking so far from you, I wake up to hear you whisper that's not true. Good morning, mercy. You call me worthy. Feels like the sun shining on my face. Living's good this side of grace. I feel it working. Goodbye to the hurting. You woke me up, put me on my way. Hallelujah, it's a brand new day. Good morning, mercy. Yeah, I'm still learning. Trust and follow I won't worry What tomorrow's Gonna bring Cause you hold it all There in your hand Now I'm lifting mine up Cause it makes me want to sing Good morning, mercy, you call me worthy, feels like the sun shining on my face, living's good this side of grace, I feel it working, goodbye to the hurting, you woke me up, put me on my way, hallelujah. It's a brand new day. Good morning, mercy. Well, glory, hallelujah. It's a brand new day. Starts all over when the daylight breaks. You're giving me a song that makes me sing. Good morning. Glory, hallelujah, it's a brand new day. Starts all over when the daylight breaks. You're giving me a song that makes me sing. Good morning. Good morning, mercy. You call me worthy. It feels like the sun shining on my face. Live good this side of grace. I feel it working. Goodbye to the hurting. You woke me up, put me on my way. Hallelujah, it's a brand new day. Good morning, mercy. Good morning, mercy. Good morning, mercy. Isn't that a great message? Great song. Good morning, mercy. <laughs> Praise God. Wasn't that good? Wasn't that just... In John chapter 12, verse 32, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Last night I dreamed an angel came.
Everybody has trials and temptations. Ooh, 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 ooh. Everybody knows how to breathe isolation. Ooh, 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 ooh. But we can lay our burdens down. Lay our burdens down. What a friend we have in Jesus He's to us, my sins are gone I see grace on every horizon And forever and ever His heart is my home Everybody has fears Everybody got worries Everybody knows sorrow, devastation But we can lay our burdens down Lay our burdens down What a friend we have in Jesus He's to us, my sins are gone I see grace on every horizon And forever and ever His heart is my home No more betrayal For He is faithful He fills me up And my cup runneth over No more betrayal For He is faithful how he is proving it over and over, over and over. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon. And forever and ever, his heart is my home. Forever and ever His heart is my home There it is. What a friend. Amen. In John chapter 14, verse number 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me.
Who could wipe away the tears From broken dreams and wasted years Until the past to disappear Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus And all the wrong turns that you won Going undue if you could Who could work it out for your good But let me tell you about my Jesus He makes the way to Calvary and pay the price for all my guilty who would care that much about me but well, let me tell you about my Jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't say let me tell you about my Jesus who would take my cross to Calvary, not my Crocs. So, sorry. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> praise God. Beautiful song. Thank you, Candace. All praise is God's. All glory is His. Amen. We are just blessed to be able to do this. And it's our, it's just our calling, whatever you want to call it. But it's us, uh, all about God. All right, Mr. Sloan. Don't waste your life Jesus ain't real That's what they say It's how they feel You're not the first And won't be the last and You can tell us all about it When you come crawling back That road you're on it just winds and winds You're spinning your wheels Wasting your time So I fold my hands And I bow my head Where they said I'd never be Is exactly where I am I've got this church And no guitar Six strings and an answered prayer Not bad for a guy going nowhere I get these calls Out on the road I heard your song On my radio We always said You'd make it big And I tell my friends I knew you back when So don't forget All us little folks When you crash and burn Remember we told you so So I fold my hands 
and I bow my head where they said I'd never be is exactly where I am I've got this church and no guitar six strings and an answered prayer not bad for a guy going nowhere I need to thank my daddy for that first set of strings and all those folks who swore I'd never be anything it took a whole lot of yes I wills and I don't care a whole lot of time of God and answered prayers this church right here and y'all sure look good out there not bad for a guy going nowhere not bad for a guy going nowhere praise god this church right here y'all look good out there amen praise god in romans chapter 12 verse number two do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to breathe. Something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Now bring you more than a song for song in itself. It's not what you have required. You search much deeper. Praise you've been storing up. Praise God. Thank you. Hey, man, as you keep your instruments on today, Chelsea, I want you just to lead us in worship today with that song. Please stand with me.
We're going to allow this song to be our, our anthem of, of prayer. I want to encourage you, if you feel led, raise your hands. Just use this as a time of worship. If you just feel like an opportunity of worship, be swaying to the music and listening to the words and allowing these words to be your prayer. You just want to sit quietly in the presence of the Lord and allow these words to be your anthem. Let's just allow this song to be our, our moment of prayer together. Chelsea, if you would lead us. When the music fades, sing it all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Now bring you more than a song for song. It's not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all Listen to this second verse. Allowed to be your prayer. King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath. Father, it's our privilege to worship and praise you. God, you are a good, good God, Lord, and you look down upon us with love and as Terry's song reminded us of mercy, we praise you, God. Lord, it's our privilege to come each week and in our own private time to just simply stop and to worship and praise you, to spend our time focused on our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords one who gives us grace and love and mercy and truth gives us the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and direct. Praise you God. Lord we want to thank you for this opportunity to just focus our hearts and minds not on the busyness of the world or what's going on outside these doors but to focus our hearts on you and God I pray that today we would all have our hearts so in tune through the Holy Spirit upon you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, my heart today is a heart of worship, God. That, that's kind of my, even this morning, I just wanted to worship you, Father. And, and that's where my heart is, God. And, and, and Lord, I just want my prayer to be a time of, of worship, Father. But Lord, we have a need in our church right now. And so, God, we just ask that you would be with our friend, buddy. Lord, we miss him up here on the stage. and He's such a part of our church. We miss Barbara being here so faithfully each and every week, even with her own bout of cancer. 
But Lord, we come before you in, in one accord. We pray that you'd bring healing to that big, powerful man. We thank you for what you're doing in his life, Lord. We thank you for the healing that's already taken place, and we give you glory for that. Lord, there was a time when we, we were scared. Lord, you brought him through that. And Father, now as his kidneys are kind of struggling, I pray that you would touch his body. Lord, even now, Father, I pray that you would restore and heal and mend. And that Lord Buddy would have a powerful testimony that would change his life. That my body was broken and there was a day when God touched me. Be with Barbara. Give her renewed strength, as Tim mentioned already. Help her, Lord, to sense your presence in the hospital room. Help her, God, not to, to allow fear to captivate her spirit. Pray peace would captivate her. And that she would see Buddy restored. And that he would come back in here with us one day and he would use that big, strong voice to worship you. Be with all the prayer requests. Be with Victoria. Continue to help her get stronger and stronger. Get her back here with us. Lord, we love you. Where there's needs that, that are life-changing in people's lives. And so we pray that you would be the healer, the stainer. And we will continue to praise you for what you're doing. But Lord, I pray, God, that our hearts would turn back to worship. And that today would be a day of worship of you. And as Greg shares, Lord, I pray that that would be a time of, of worship. Be a time of understanding you and in the last seven days of Jesus' life, Lord, I pray that you would use this message to help us have a true another encounter with you. And Lord, we love you and we praise you. We lift you up and give you glory. It's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. With a heart of worship, and uh, I just want to encourage you to find somebody you don't know. Give a hug, shake a hand. Children, you're dismissed, and we'll start again real quickly.
Well, I want to invite you to begin to find your way back to your seat, and I'm excited to introduce you to my new friend. I know today is going to be a wonderful day, and uh, I look forward to the message today. The last seven days of Jesus' life, and uh, so I know that you'll enjoy it as well. Greg and I have uh, got to know each other through, uh, through the internet, uh, th not through the internet, but through texting and visiting on the phone. Y'all get seated. <laughs> We want to get started, all you standing around the back. We want to get started in just a minute or so, so you want to make your way. See, what the people in the back row don't know is how long his message is. Wally and I, we get it, man. We're ready. Anyway, we want to go ahead and get started. Um, I have got to enjoy getting to know Greg uh, through text messages. He's a, quite a funny guy. I, uh, one message will be serious, and then a few days later, I'll get something that's kind of funny. It's great to meet his wife, Susan, and have her here with us. Uh, and uh, they're out of um, it's Indiana. I knew I was going to do that wrong. It, it, I told him it don't matter. It, it starts with an I. It's up north. It's all the same to us. So it's from Illinois by way of Florida. And anyway, give him a well uh, a round of applause and welcome him as he comes forward. Thank you, brother. Can I give you a hard time? No, that's okay. <laughs> well, shalom. shalom. Great, you guys all know Hebrew. Um, I'm just a nice Jewish boy that loves Jesus, but I'm a Yankee. And I'm a Jewish Christian. But let me tell you some things. My favorite show was Dallas growing up. And my favorite, to my wife's chagrins, my favorite are Willie Nelson, Hank Williams Jr. So I feel right at home. But, um, you know, I, I honestly, I stand before the Lord. I was going to pack my cowboy boots, but my luggage was like overweight. So maybe next time. Uh, I used to live in South Florida for 24 years. It's the second largest Jewish population. I was in Jewish missions. But I moved to Illinois a year and a half because I read somewhere there's no greater love for a man to leave Fort Lauderdale in November to drive all the way to Chicago to marry Susan. <laughs> but um, we're going to walk about talk about the last seven days of Jesus I think some scriptures will be on the wall or on the, on the screen. Um, if not, you could just go on your phone. And um, I want to share that to understand Jesus' life, we need to understand the first Passover. And when we go through Palm Sunday or Good Friday or Resurrection, they're meaningful. But sometimes years after years, the meaning, sometimes it's not, as, it's not as much as before. For example, there's a law. When I went to University of Illinois, I got my accounting degree. And there was something called the law of diminishing returns, which means that your first cookie is not as good as the 12th cookie, except if they're the Samoans on the Girl Scout. Who loves the Samoans, man? I can devour those. Anyways, um, but I want to go through some things this last seven days. And I want you to look at it as a diamond, maybe some things that you've missed, but this is the last seven days through Jesus' life. And I'm going to read in Exodus 12, but basically here's the whole theme of the message. The lamb of Passover was chosen, was tested, and was passed, and they used that lamb for Passover. In the same way, Yeshua, can you say the name Yeshua? Yeshua. That's his Hebrew name. I, wanna, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Jesus never heard the name Jesus growing up. There's no letter J in Hebrew. Did you know that? Yeshua, that's what he heard from childhood to the cross. Well, he was selected, tested, and sacrificed for us. So I'm going to talk about um, Exodus 12, 1 through 13. And this is the basic of the message. And we're going to talk more about Passover tonight. So come to the Passover Seder. I guarantee you, you will eat food that you will never eaten before. And it's the amazing thing. The rabbis say everything you eat and everything you do 
has to do with redemption. So come tonight to the Passover. So I'm going to start in Exodus 12, 1 through 13. I'm not sure if this is going to be on, on the screen. It says, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregations of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month, they are take each land for themselves. Remember that, the tenth of the month. According to their father's household, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a lamb, the nearest to his house, one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb is not blemished, the male one year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Remember that, 14th day. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill the lamb at twilight. Moreover, they should take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts, then on the lintel. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its leg, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over till morning, but whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you should eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. I think that was the first example of fast food stand. Not sure. It's the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night. And I will strike down all the firstborns in the land of Egypt. Both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the households where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You get the name Passover? Uh, and no plague will defile you to destroy you when I strike the lamb of Egypt. Now, when you read these verses, you see that the lamb was selected, it was tested, and it passed the test. Now, the head of the house who selected this lamb, if you notice, it was on the 10th of the, 10th of the month, and then the 14th of the month is when they sacrificed the lamb. Now, the rabbis, I think, are right because they said you had to test the lambs for four days— so that they were out without spot, without blemish, and undefiled, and they could be perfect to be sacrificed on Passover. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that we have a high priest who is tempted in all of our weaknesses, one without sin, and that is Jesus Christ. He is our perfect lamb. And what's amazing is that you see this in the life of Jesus, that you know he was fully human, fully God, but his human part, he saw pain, hunger, thirst, and rejection, and loneliness. And when they, when they sacrificed the lambs, and they had four days in between, I always wonder about the kids. Did they name that pet? Did they take them out for a walk? Was, you know, was that their wonderful animal that they grew to love? And I hope they didn't love that animal too much, because the head of the house sacrifice it on the, on, the, on, the, on the 14th of the sun. And it's interesting, if you read in the scriptures, we'll go about a little bit about this in, in Passover tonight, but it says you take the blood and you put it on the top of the lentils and then the two side posts. And it, it's interesting, when the, when the blood drips, it will down, and the two side posts, it sticks. Isn't it incredible that every single home in Egypt that the angel of death passed over had the sign of the cross. Now, when I was in Hebrew school, I said to my rabbi, I said, I'm smarter than God. And he said, oh, really, Gershom? That was my name. How are you smarter than God? I said, why didn't the Jewish, why didn't God tell the Jewish people to just paint that door red? Why did they have to just put the spot on the lentil and the two side posts? And obviously I was wrong because it was forming the sign of a cross, which is pretty amazing. Now, I don't know if you caught this, but it says that in Exodus 12, 46, it says, The lamb should be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring any of the meat outside of the house, nor you are to break any of the bones on the lamb. Now, here's what's really interesting. 
Jesus was on the cross, and what they did is they would hit, they would break their legs, people being crucified, because then their legs could not push them up to breathe. But Jesus had already died. Isn't that interesting? They did not break his bones the same way they wouldn't break the bones of a lamb. And I'm always amazed by the crucifixion of Jesus. And I read this article by the Mayo Clinic. You know, it's pretty amazing that if you go over the actual what happened when he was crucified, the first thing is when you're up on the cross, instantly your shoulders are dislocated for six hours. Can I tell you something? Last year I had bursitis, which is a pain in the shoulder. If I moved, I cried like a baby. It was such a sharp pain, and our Lord did this for six hours. Not only that, he was pierced. And it, crucifixion, I don't know if you know this, but you died by asphyxiation. You could not push the carbon monoxide, Susan, or dioxide? Dioxide, I always get that wrong. You couldn't push that out. And it's amazing, the heart would push so hard, it would beat like 220 minutes to get that out. And you would die, basically, because you couldn't get out the air. And you know he was whipped 39 times. And he wasn't just whipped. These Roman soldiers got their PhD in pain, torture, suffering, and death. You know the guys that whipped him? That was their full-time job. Eight hours a day, they put this so that they would perfectly be able to smack their back and split it open. They used bones and stones on that whip. Now, it's interesting that there was a Jewish uh, historian, his name was Josephus. He wasn't a believer in Jesus. He said that when you got whipped, they would lay your back out so taut or so straight that when you hit them with the whip, many times you would see organs out of the back. How do you push up on a rugged cross when your back is literally opened up? Well, we see from the first lambs that they were selected for four days. They were tested, and they passed the test, and they were used. What you need to know is those first lambs, they freed the Jewish people from bondage and slavery to the Pharaoh. But with Jesus, we got a much better deliverance, guys. We're free from bondage and slavery to sin. I will take door number two. But you know what? I would have liked to see the uh, parting of the Red Sea. Was that cool or what? I mean, I want to see that on DVD. So let's look at the start of the week for Palm Sunday. Uh, this was 2023 years ago. It was the entrance of the King of King, Lord of Lords. And what you need to know, you probably know this, but during that time, the Jewish people, they were revved up because the Messiah most likely would come on Passover. So the Romans were on high alert. They were looking for a political military messiah who will overthrow the Romans. So he, he didn't overthrow the Romans, but he was the king of kings, lord of lords. First, he came to get us right with God, freedom from sins. But he comes back, guaranteed, guys, fact check true. He's going to set up his kingdom and power and glory. Hallelujah. Amen. So I want to talk about Jesus on Palm Sunday. Uh, I'm going to read from Matthew 21, verse 4 through 8, and I'll go a little bit in verse 9. It said, This took place to fill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughters of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on donkey, even on a coat, the foal of beasts of burden. Disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed. Disciples brought the donkey and the coat and laid their coats on them, and Jesus sat on the coats. Most of the crowds spread their coats in the road. The others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Stop here. I'm Jewish. Waving branches, nothing has to do with Passover. We wave branches on the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, and I'll get back to that. So, verse 9, the crowd's going ahead of them, and they said three things. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is the highest. 
Now let's unpack this. What are they saying? They're saying, Jesus, you're the son of David, Number is a messianic title. Number two, Hosanna. They're asking this Jesus to save us. Three, they're claiming him from the Davidic kingship. And they say they're using the blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the name of Messiah. Now, honestly, if I was the Messiah and I'm coming into Jerusalem, I am not coming in on a donkey. I've got a white stallion. You know, I don't really know horses. I'm probably doing myself a disfavor here. But a white horse, amazing. I got a theme song. I got an outfit. I got a hat. I got paparazzis everywhere. That's how I would come in to Jerusalem as the Messiah. But isn't it amazing that our Savior comes in on a donkey? Well, he actually fulfilled Zechariah 9.9, a Messianic prophecy. It says, Behold, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of beast of burden, which means this has never been ridden. Now, when it says that he's from the Davidic kingship, and he says that he's the son of David, this is really important. Because no person today can say they're from the Messiah. And I say this because the temple records were destroyed in 70 AD. That kept all the genealogies. That's why Jesus and Luke and Matthew, they can prove the genealogy because it was written before the temple was destroyed. They had those genealogies. You cannot say today, I'm from the line of Judah and the line of David. I mean, even Ancestry.com does not go back 3,500 years ago. And it's only the Messiah would become from the line of David. So I want to talk about those branches it was, they, they waved the branches, so I'm thinking wrong holiday, because it was the Feast of Tabernacles was where they made booze, and in those booths, one had the Ark of the Covenant. You guys, do you know what that is? Have you seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, now everybody knows what this is. The Ark of the Covenant were God's mercy seat. He made an atonement for the nation of Israel. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night guided the Jewish people for 40 years. And that was in a tabernacle. And because that was in a tabernacle, Jewish people on the holidays, they would build booths and they would take the tabernacle and they would bless the Lord God who created north, east, west, and south. They'd raise it to the heavens and they'd raise it to earth and they would go in the tabernacle because that's where God reigned with the Jewish people. God was with them. Jesus is God in the flesh. They were perfectly right. They probably didn't know why they were, why they were waving these um, palm branches. But it says in John 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I'm going to drop down to 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory as one of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So isn't that amazing that Jewish people probably didn't realize it, but they're waving palm branches before the Lord? I think that's amazing that he would, we would rejoice before the Lord. Okay, now I'm going to go where Jesus goes head to head with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Rodians. But before I do this, I have to clear up something. I, you guys probably don't know that, probably know this, but sometimes... People think that Jesus is love and grace and mercy. He is, but he also has a God of judgment and he all God of righteousness. You know, sometimes I hear people online thinking like, Jesus is like Mr. Rogers. Can't we all get along? Isn't everything great? Jesus is just love and mercy. No, he is love and mercy, but he is the Lamb of God. But he also is in the line of Judah. Amen? And that's who Jesus is. I mean, you look Jesus in his life. He was a serious guy. I mean, he said some serious controversial things. He told Peter and John to just leave their business and follow him. This was a family business. They had boats. They had like lots of money invested in it. And they just leave. Jesus said to one guy who said he had to bury that he had to go and bury his father, and he said, "Bury your dead." And that's pretty serious. He told people that they were going to hell. 
that's politically incorrect today. Uh, he told people they were whitewashed tombs. They're like graves with bones in it. Uh, he made nature obey him. That, that is not a, that's an amazing thing. This, the, he stopped the rain. He took nature to obey him. He killed 2,000 pigs. Not good for the bacon industry. He told his mom he was busy. That took chutzpah. Jewish for guts. He offended the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and the Romans. He was an equal opportunity offender. He was politically incorrect. And get this. He did not have to go to diversity and sensitivity training. He just called it is. What's interesting is when I talk to people at a lot of these outreaches we do, I find that people make God in their own image and not who God is. Um, Susan and I, we talked a lot of uh, LGBTQ at, at these fairs that we do. And what they do is they take the Bible and not read it as the Bible. They read in their sexual sin and rebellion to the Bible. They say, well, man and a woman should not lie down together. They say, oh, that's prostitution. Oh, or, you know, that was back in the days. No, it says a man and a woman should not lie down. And a lot of people in their sin, or if they kind of walk away from the Lord, it's for moral reasons. It's for they want to have their own sin, their sexual sin. And, you know, we should live according to the word who will set us free. Instead of getting all of ourselves looking at the Bible and doing all these somersaults, trying to, to rationalize our behavior. And I see that so much today. But, you know, what does the Bible say? It's exegetical. What does it say? Don't put your stuff in there and say, I want to put, you know, I want to put myself in here. I sometimes feel like people, it's like a smorgasbord. And like the God's part is all the healthy stuff, the salads and the lean meats, whatever you do. And it's like people want to go through and like, I'll take a little bit of Buddhism. I like a little Confucianism. I'll do a little Christianity, not much. Uh, oh, I, you know, I like Hinduism. And that's what people do today. They just pick and choose their own religion. All right, let's get to Monday. Jesus goes to the temple. People that say that Jesus is not political or they say Jesus never got angry. You are not reading your Bible. Matthew 21, 12, 13, 13, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to him, said to them, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you are making it robbers, a robber's den. So Jesus goes to the temple and he just wrecks it because what they're doing is Jewish people all over for Passover, no matter where you are, in Deuteronomy 16, 16 said, you, if you're on Passover, uh, Feast of Weeks, and also Feast of Tabernacle, if you're Jewish, on those holidays, you have to schlep up to Jerusalem. So if you're living far away, you got to go up to Jerusalem. Now, you're taking your whole family. Do you want to take animals too? I mean, what a pain. So they would go there and they'd buy animals, but you'd go there and they'd say, oh, that lamb is normally $50, but we'll sell it to you for $600. And they got you. Because if you have to atone for your sins, you got to pay that price. So that was Jesus. So uh, he was challenged there, and he passed the test. He did the right thing. And now he's going on to debate them. Uh, in verse 23, this is from Matthew 21, uh, 23 through 27. Uh, they try to trap him again, the Pharisees. It says, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while I was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Guys, this is very Jewish. Answer a Jewish question with a question. Very Jewish. Why are you doing this? Why are you asking? <laughs> very Jewish thing to do. Uh, Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Which, if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from, from what source? From heaven or from men? 
and they began raising on themselves. Can you just imagine? They're like, all right, let's have a powwow here. What are they? You know, they're just talking. They don't know how to answer it. Saying, if from heaven he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. We're up seven to zero. Jesus just scored a touchdown there. He destroyed the Pharisees. Don't you love it when Jesus just like dismantles people and just like slam ducks them? I love them. But see, he's the lamb of God. He was just like those lambs. He was selected. He was tested and he passed. And it's all these verses that I'm going to give you. It's kind of like the political gotcha questions. You ever see that? They try to get a politician. Well, you say that you support, uh, you know, sport, uh, whatever. And they say, but you did this, this, and this. And they try to get you. you know, the gotcha questions. And they're trying to nail Jesus. They're trying to get him in a falsehood, to backtrack, or a mistake. But Jesus runs the table with them. And you'll see. In Matthew 22, 15 through 22, we're now in the second quarter. Okay? Now it's Jesus versus the Pharisees and Herodians. We'll see how Jesus does. He's selected. He'll be tested. Will he pass the test? Well, you got to know something. Herodians are not a big fan of the Pharisees. Those are the Pharisees were the Jewish people that sided with the Pharisees. They had a quarter foot in Judaism, and they had three quarters with the Romans. They really wanted to be friends with the Romans. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to have their power based on the Herodians. And the Pharisees working with the Herodians is like the conservative Republicans working with liberal Democrats to pass the bill on immigration. It just doesn't happen. But it happens here. Why? There's a saying, my, the enemy of my enemy is your friend. So what they're doing is they're, they don't want, they, they hate each other, but they hate Jesus more. So now they're going to work to get Jesus. So in Matthew 22, 15 through 22, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him, what he said. And they said, uh, send your disciples to him along with the road and saying, teacher. Now I'm going to read this. Do you think the Herodians really mean this? Teacher. We know that you are truthful and teach the way of God's truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. That's what totally total buttering up to Jesus, being untrue. Um, they said, tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to give to poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their mouths and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? This is not, this is not Barney here. This is not nice, let's all get along. He called them hypocrites. He said, um, show me a coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to him, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to him, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God's what are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed and left him, leaving him and then away. You know, I just want one time to have Orthodox Jews and conservative Jews just trying to get me on something. And I answer it and they're like, hmm. I'm amazed, and I walk away. Uh, closest I ever had to this is this rabbi came up to me, and he's like, he, we were at a fair, and he came up to me. He's like, there should be no Christians. And I said, really, rabbi, why? And he said, because none of you act like Jesus. And instantly, this was above my pay grade. I just answered him. I'm like, you shouldn't be a rabbi. And he got all mad. He's like, why? I said, because none of your people are like Moses. And he, steam came out of his yarmulke. And he was so upset, he literally could not talk. He was so upset. So that's my one time of being that. So we see Jesus, he passes the test because if he said we should give the money to Rome, the Herodians would say, yay, great. But the Pharisees would be say, what about the money from the temple? And the opposite, if he said this money's for the temple, the Herodians will say, "This. what about the Romans? So they're trying to entrap him. They say, Jesus says, why are you testing me? You're hypocrites. But once again, Jesus was selected and he tested and he got another touchdown, slam dunk. I just love when Jesus just destroys the people. Okay, guys, Jesus is up 14-0.
We're going into halftime. No points. They have gotten no, the defense, they've gotten zero points. I mean, they're on fire. They're like the 1985 Chicago Bears, and I can say that because I'm a Chicago Bears fan. I know you probably like the Cowboys. But the last time, one of the last times he's tested, um, the Sadducees come up to the plate. And the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in supernatural. They believe in the Torah. So in Matthew 22, 23 through 25, they say, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin marries his wife and raises up children for his brother. Then there are seven brothers to us, and their first are married to die, and having no children left, his wife to his brother. So also the second and the third, down the seventh, last of all, the woman dies. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Now, to me, the biggest theological question is, why are all these men dying? I mean, what is it? The wife's cooking? Is she poisoning them? I mean, I don't get it. They're dying, they're dying, they're dying. Anyways, it's interesting that the Pharisees believe in the resurrections and the Sadducees don't not. So by bringing this up, he's basically saying to Sadducees that uh, they're wrong, that there is a resurrection. And they were sad, you see. You get it? Because they didn't believe in resurrection? All right, that's one of my bad no jokes. But anyways, here's what Jesus says in verse 29. He's saying to the Sadducees, you are mistaken. Not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. I mean, this is a carpenter. He's telling these Sadducees, these rabbis who studied for many years, you are mistaken. You don't understand the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So he's like saying there's a resurrection, there's angels, the Sadducees don't believe in either. So he's like, in your face. You're wrong. It says, but guarding the resurrection dead, have you not read what, the, what has spoken to you by God? And this is one of the main verses in Judaism. I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished. And he was talking about his resurrection and that he will be raised from the dead. So Jesus passes his death. And he, again, he was selected, he was um, tested, and he passed it. So, all right, Jesus is up now 21-0. This is the fourth quarter. This is what I call the last hurrah, the Hail Mary. This is their last chance during Jesus' week. They're going to get him. They're going to bring out all, all the shots. So the Pharisees heard that the Sadducees is basically bombed out. So they get a lawyer. Can you imagine this? A Jewish lawyer? Amazing. He's going to ask him a question. He says, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And the person said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love their neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. What's amazing is... This is one of the first commands in Judaism. We have 613 laws. What Jewish person, what Gentile person, there's only one person that's ever obeyed this the entire life, and that is Jesus, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, and mind, and you shall with your soul and your mind, and shall love your neighbor as yourself. Is there anybody in here that does this all the time? Nobody does that. So it's amazing that you have the Jewish lawyer asking this question. And to me, this is so funny because I grew up in a Jewish household. And growing up, I had three choices what to be when I grew up. If I was very smart, I would be a doctor. My dad was a doctor. You're very smart, you become a doctor. Now, if you're pretty smart, you become a lawyer. And if you're so-so, you become a CPA. I must have been so-so because I became a CPA. But it's kind of interesting. Love the Lord your God, heart, soul, might. There's this really interesting story in the Jewish oral law, what the rabbi said. There's this great rabbi, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. And one kid, kind of precocious teenager, said, hey, rabbi, on your one foot, give us the basic synopsis of the Torah, the first five books of, books of Moses. And the rabbi said, you're crazy. You're Meshuggah. I can't do this. Go away. You know, you're obnoxious. Then he went to the one on the Shammai, 
and he said, tell us the whole Torah on one foot. And this rabbi went on one foot and said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, and might. Love your neighbor as yourself, and the rest is commentary. And that's really the basics. You know, if you love the Lord your God with your heart, strength, and might, you are the basics. So that is everything. Jesus passed the test that week. And I'm going to go about, the, when you talk about the passing of the test, Jesus passed the test of death and also resurrection. Um, when I was in Jews for Jesus, we had a, a Moody a professor. He was like 82. Uh, he was a Jewish believer in the 1940s before there was any Jewish people. And he taught us this acronym, SIDE, S-I-D-E. S is substitution, I is identification, D is death, and E is an exchange. And before I do this and I go to substitute, I need to tell you about Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the most powerful messianic passage in the Bible. When, I, when, I've, been decide, when I've been reaching out to Jewish people, I ask them to read Isaiah 53. And 100% of the time, you know what they say? Hey, I'm not interested in the New Testament. I don't care about this guy named Paul. He's like, why don't you give me the new, why don't you give me something in the Old Testament? That's how powerful Isaiah 53 is. There was once a Jewish gal, her name was Leah, and I shared Isaiah 53 with her, and she said, have you no shame? Why would you make up a chapter in the Bible just to convince me that Jesus is the Messiah? I said, go home, check your, your Bible, your Tanakh. Hebrew for Old Testament. And she gets down the Bible and she opens up to Isaiah 53 in Hebrew. And she was Israeli. And on Isaiah 53, in the margins, is her father's writing. Said, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. She talked to her dad and she came to faith in Messiah. So Isaiah 53 is powerful. But what about substitute? The animal was substituted with the atonement that we deserve. Isaiah 53, 4, it says, He was born our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him. He was smit stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Jesus was the innocent lamb who was led to the slaughter. How about identified? In the high priesthood on Passover, they would take that one lamb, and all the sins of Israel would go into that lamb. And he was all the sins, and then when he would be sacrificed, the national sins of Israel would be atoned for. Isaiah 53, verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What about death? The animal would die. Look at Isaiah 53, 7. It says, the lamb is led to the slaughter. Verse 8, he is cut off from the land of the living. That Isaiah 53, that person in that chapter dies. He's cut off from the land of the living. And it says in verse 9, he was given a grave with the rich and the wicked. The death was exchanged for our sins. The animal's death was exchanged for the national sins of Israel. How about Isaiah 53, 11? Oh, I forgot to tell you something. Isaiah 53 is never read in synagogue, ever. They read the entire Bible, but they skip Isaiah 53. One rabbi said, we skipped it because it sounds too much like Jesus. Hello? You know, the great theologian Ronald Reagan said, if it looks like a duck, if it flies like a duck, if it quacks like, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Isaiah 53, 11, he makes his soul an offering for sin. He pleases the Lord to bruise him for the transgressions of my people. He was slain. Hallelujah. He not only was he test, tested, not only passed, but he went farther and he died for our sins. You know, I would die for the sins of Susan. I'd probably die for you, Sharky. But I don't know the rest of you. I don't know if I would die for you. Honestly, he died for us, our sins. I mean, and not only that, okay, he died for his sins. We get his righteousness. It says he, be, he, was, he was not sin. He became sin 
So the righteousness of God is in us through him. And if you don't say hallelujah, if you don't say praise the Lord, there's something wrong with you guys. That our sins are forgiven. And we get his righteousness. Hallelujah. So what did Jesus give to us? I'm going to end on my favorite verse. John 5, 24. He was substitute. He was identified. His death. And we got an exchange. What did we get? John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears me and believes him who sent me, number one, we have eternal life. Number two, we don't come into judgment. Number three, we pass over from death to life. I want door number one, two, and three. Guys, this is amazing. We do not get judged. I mean, you and I probably committed 10 sins before we walked into this church. Our sins are forgiven past, present, future. We're not judged. I thank God that I'm not judged for my stupidity. And even as believers, don't we all know what God wants us to do? Am I the only one here this morning that says, no, I refuse, I will not do that? But we pass over from death to everlasting life. And that's what we do for Rock of Israel Ministries. I'm going to show you a quick two-minute video. Is that okay? Can we do that now? This is what I do for Rock of Israel. Um, I'm the director of Jewish evangelism uh, in Illinois. And we go to all these fairs and preaching the gospel. And we do direct evangelism in Illinois. But if you want to watch that real quick. Did it have sound? Since 2006, Rock of Israel Ministries has found a unique way to reach both Jewish and Gentile people with the gospel. In the marketplace, we've been renting booths at state and county fairs. However, one of the best fairs we have found is actually not in the U.S., but in Toronto, Canada. It is at the Canadian National Exposition, also called the CNE, and it has 1.5 million attendees each year. Toronto is a city much like New York, with a very diverse population. We meet more Jewish people here than any other fair. And with our many Jewish and biblical products out there on the table, including books, Art of the Covenant models, jewelry, and more, it brings many curious people over to us each day, much like fishing and bait. For instance, last year at this fair, we were able to share the Messiah with over 325 Jewish people who came to our booth. That number is not even including the hundreds more non-Jewish people we speak with as well. And even if they do not stop to talk, hundreds more will stop dead in their tracks and read our large banner, which says, Jesus made me kosher. Jewish people will stand there for a minute or more and read how Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Of course, many non-Jewish people stop to read it as well. We cannot tell you how productive this unique banner has been over the years. For those who do come over and talk with us, most will take a bookmark, which is a copy of the banner, Jesus Made Me Kosher, and listen as we share how we are Jews who believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, promised to our people. Of course, there will be some who are open to the message. If they are open, we will give them a free book of Jewish testimonies or something similar. Conversely, there are always some who oppose us being there as well. Sometimes we get a visit from local rabbis who seek to stop what we are doing. They show up with video cameras and argue with us. Nevertheless, we are sure that the gospel will go forward no matter what the situation. And the booth in Toronto is just one of the many booths we have rented and continue to rent across North America each year, armed with good volunteer staff who love God and love the Jewish people. With all that being said, may we ask for your help in reaching people? Renting the booth in Toronto... Thank you guys so much. Can you guys get out one of these bulletins that has this handsome young man on the front? And go to the third one, the third level, the last one, and we're going to do the, ter the, the ancient ceremony of, ceremony of the card. So we're going to rip this on the count of three, okay? I've been told that if any church rips us on exactly the count of three, it will usher in the second coming of Jesus. So no pressure whatsoever, but we're going to do this on the count of three. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven. Well, we'll have one more chance tonight to do this, but um, I hope you guys have a chance to fill this out. We really need your help for prayer, and this you'll get our prayer letter, and you'll learn more about the Jewish roots, the Christian faith. You can fill this out. If you feel led and you'd like to support Rock of Israel or ministry to the Jewish people, that would be a blessing. Because it's interesting, like if you're a, a baker, you sell bread to people and you can make money. Well, if you're a tailor, you can do suits. Well, I'm a missionary. I cannot go to Jewish people because they won't give. So I go to the church that you guys would love to reach Jewish people. And we go to these fairs, we read Jewish people, we read agnostic, we read Catholics, LGBT. And I want to share with you a couple things that we have. We have some free resources out there. Please take all these. This is called the report. If you know of a Jewish person, this is great for them. Just say, hey, these are some Messianic prophecies. Love to know what you think of that. We have a great track called God's Three Revelations. It's been told it's like gospel on steroids. And this is an amazing track. And recently we sent one, uh, we, sent, we handed all these out, and a lady that works, uh, a lady got a bill, and she sent the bill into a, a, to her electric company with this tract, and a person wrote back that they read this, and they prayed to receive the Lord, and now they're following Jesus. So this is a great tract. And we all know the month of June is Pride Month, and it is in our faces uh, this was a track written by Susan and I about the LGBTQ. It's, it's only four pages. It's, it's just you know challenging them to find God's uh, will in their lives and love and uh, facts about LGBTQ and transgenderism, how it leads to depression. So this is great. This is free. And I do have some uh, products on the table. Uh, I have some great books. This is my favorite book. From Tradition to Eternity, because I wrote it. And this is a great book. It has my story, how to witness messianic prophecies, how to witness the Jewish people. And if you, buy, if you get this and buy this, all our books are $10. Um, if you can't afford it, just take it. If you want to give more than $10, it'll help us to um, uh, print more of these. But my wife, Susan, is in Chapter 6. I called her Sarah because I wrote this a while ago. We weren't married. And Susan's witness to me when I was in high school, when I was 14 years old. So I'm just wondering, it's great to be married to you. I, pro I might not be here if it wasn't for Susan. And um, we have this great book on the Jewish feasts of Israel. And this is a wonderful book. And we have some Judaica. A lot of people are like, what's Judaica? Well, you know God's word says to put his word on the doorpost of your home. This is called the mezuzah. And Jewish people put this on our home. And the reason why we have all this Jewish stuff is tons of Jewish people come to our table. Susan and I are going to do San Diego Fair. And Jewish people come and they're going to buy the mezuzah. And they're going to hear about the Messiah. And we have amazing encounters with Jewish people that never thought about the Lord, and we have conversations with them. And even people that walk by, we have these gigantic nine-foot posters that say, Jesus made me kosher with the gospel on it. So, And also we give them literature. So I hope that you guys stand with me, even if you're not prepared to give. I know we have a way you can make out a check or a credit card on that slip. If you're not prepared, just go ahead and hand out the slip. We'd love to stay connected to you. Uh, finally, there's a slip on here that you can give us your unsaved Jewish friend, relative, co-worker. And here's the beauty of it. We're going to follow up on them. And the beauty is they'll never, know that you sent, they'll never know that you sent us a name. We will not give you your name. So if you want to put on that slip or follow up with a Jewish friend, that would be great. So I know I went a little long this morning. I had seven days of Jesus to pack through. Tonight at the Passover, I'll go in a little more depth. And I hope you guys come. And uh, I love your pastor, Pastor Charkey. Uh, known him a long time, about a month. But he is a great guy. And uh, after service, I'm going to see if I can ride a bull for eight seconds. We'll see. But no, I just, you know, Pastor Charkey is what we call in Jewish ministry a kosher hearted Gentile. 
because he really loves the Jewish people and it's so delight to be here and build our friendships. And, um, you know, I broke, I broke some bucket lists today. I have never preached on horseshoes. So this is pretty amazing. So thank you guys for your attention. And I'll be back in the table. Come visit anything you want to buy or purchase. It helps the evangelism we do. God bless you guys. Well, what wonderful information, just full of, full of information and uh, stuff that we don't normally talk about. And, uh, but anyway, I really enjoyed today. Be back this evening at, for dinner at 5 o'clock. After dinner, we're going to be doing the Seder meal. You don't want to miss it. Uh, it's going to change the way you take communion from that moment on. You're going to realize everything they did during that time pointed to Jesus. So just as he shared a little bit today, come be, be a part of that. I, I think it'll be the best thing you can do this evening is... Is, is participate in that. I want to pray, and then uh, and then we want to make sure we give them a love offering, a gift, and uh, so if you could help us with that, that'd be wonderful. Gentlemen, uh, after after we get done praying, if you could just simply stack your chairs in, in your area, that'd help us tremendously get ready for this evening. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and to you know, learn something. Uh, Father, we are so thankful, God, that that Jesus passed the test. He was everything that he needed to be to go on and then be that ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could go on in victory. Bless us now as we leave. Bring us back together tonight. God, just lead our feet back to this building so we can once again uh, fellowship with you and learn something valuable for the rest of our lives. God, for all you do, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. God bless each of you. You're dismissed.